Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much again for life, for waking us up this morning. We thank you for the health that we have, for the ability to hear your word. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us here to teach us and grow us. Thank you for the fellowship. And God, may we hide your word within our heart that we might not sin against thee. Please be with our speaker this day, all of us, Lord, and watch over and keep us. Humble our hearts that you might lift us up. We ask your blessings and your Holy Spirit to be here to teach us, Lord. And we thank you in advance for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yesterday I had to, um, well, I ran out of time, so I was unable to finish what I started. And one of the disadvantages of um, doing those presentation, presentations like these from your head, you can't remember exactly all the things that you covered. Um, so I, might, I may go over some things that I covered yesterday, but um, reputation is good, amen? Um, yesterday we were, we were, if you would go with me to Revelation 16, just to refresh your memory. Revelation 16, verses 12, we read that, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the waters thereof were dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And we were looking at, we were looking at, um, we went to ancient Babylon, and we saw that um, God had anointed Cyrus to um, enter Babylon and to um, start the ball rolling to prepare the way for the coming of the King of the East, who is Christ Jesus. You know that Cyrus is a type of Christ who played a part in setting Jerusalem free in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. And we saw that John the Baptist um, prepared the way for the coming of the Lord in his ministry. I want you to notice that, um, that Gabriel's work in guiding this prophecy um, is a vital part of the, of the message in that Gabriel speaks to Daniel concerning um, when Jerusalem would be set free when, and the rebuilding of the city. And then he comes down and speaks to Zechariah, um, Elijah's father or John's father in regards to how he should be brought up in order that he may clear the way for the King of the East, Christ Jesus. And we see his work um, in instructing John concerning the things that are to transpire at the end of the world in regards to, again, the coming of the King of the East. Um, we recognize that the movements that were taking place are not under the trumpet were connected with preparing the way for the King of the East. And we recognize that the Battle of Nineveh which, was, which followed the battle between Persia and Rome, Eastern Rome, under the fifth and sixth trumpet, um, followed by the, the, the um, Islamic powers tormenting and slaying Rome, which brought us to the end of the prophecy of the prophetic time, the 391 years and 15 days in 1840. Um, we recognize that Revelation 9 is, if you will go with me to Revelation 9, Revelation 9 is depicted, is depicting the fifth trumpet. Um, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven onto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And we recognize that the darkness were um, upon the kingdom of the east by this power that was rising from the bottomless pit. 
which the Battle of Nineveh opened the door to. And um, following that, the six angels sounded in verse 13. And the six angels sounded, and I heard a voice from, from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the six angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. These, the four angels were loose for the time period that um, produced the drying up of the power of the East. Um, Constantinople was conquered by the Ottoman Turk. Um, remembering that Vatican City sits upon the waters of both East and West. Um, on Western Rome, 1798, Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimonies, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. This beast that is rising in 1798 um, results, resulted in the deadly wound of the papacy, thus drying up the waters on the west. Um, the drying up of the waters is preparing the way for the coming of the king of the east. If we think carefully on, well, I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation 17, um, verse 8 of the chapter, well, verse 7 of the chapter. Uh, excuse me. Verse 7 of the chapter, and, and the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, which had the seven heads and ten horns. We know that the beast that is carrying her at that point in time was the lamb-like beast as it carried the doctrines of Rome. Really, it was carrying the throne of Babylon. Um, understanding that the United States of America plays the role of the third Persian power as it ascends the throne, which Mystery Babylon sat on before 1798. And as this we, we can see clearly the, the, the parallels between um, Cyrus's kingdom as it removed, as it removed the, um, the Babylonian throne, the, um, Belshazzar's throne. And, um, so we can, we, we can see the parallel as the, as the, as the preparation is, is, is going on. We can, we can see also the connection between the 2300 days where Ancient Israel is coming out of Babylon in 457 BC, and modern Israel is coming out of Babylon in 1844. We can see the central pillar that connects the two comings um, out of Babylon. Now, uh, I'm giving you this brief overview of some of the things that we were speaking of yesterday, so that you could um, more or less have a have a glimpse of. Um, what these things are about and as we lay the platform for where we want to take this. Uh, in 1840, as we see this beast from 1798 carrying the throne of Babylon, carrying the woman to the 1840 time period, um, we can also visualize, if you follow the mouse pointer, you can also visualize the winds that are blowing at that time. Why do I say the winds are blowing? Well, um, if, you will, uh, if you will go with me to Revelation, excuse me. Mm. I should have rebooted, Jeff.
Um, just bear with me a second. I'm going to have to. Right. If you will go with me, I'm, I spoke of the winds that are blowing in, in, the, in, the, in the period following the Battle of Nineveh. And if you will go with me to Revelation chapter um, 9. In Revelation 9, we just read it earlier on, that... Um, Verse 13, and the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from, from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. If you will notice that in verse 4, a, commandment, a command was given that this power was to be restrained. But now, in verse, in verse 13, this power is set loose. Four angels are set loose, and that, those angels are given the power basically to hurt the earth as they began to slay Constantinople. Now, these winds, those winds were blowing. They were blowing at, um, between, sorry, under the Second World. They were blowing, and we're coming up to the time period of 1840 where if you turn with me to Revelation 7, and we looked at some of this before, Revelation 7. Uh, Revelation 7 is a prophecy that has a dual application um, in the time period of the Millerites and in the reputation of the ten virgins again to the very letter. So this angel comes down as the woman that is, that, as the woman is being carried by the beast brought to view in Revelation 17, and the winds that are blowing across um, uh, as the winds are blowing across coming over to the time period of 1840, the angel descends in verse 1, we read, and after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that, it, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So there, those four angels whom, to whom it was given to hurt the earth, the... the Namely, the, the winds that are blowing, are blowing from Revelation 9 um, under the sixth trumpet, the second woe. This, um, this angel from the east commands them now, put the restraint back on them to hold the winds that are blowing till the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. Now, in... Um, in that time, that in, in, in that sealing time, Spirit of Prophecy described the angel that descended in Revelation 10 as a personage of Jesus. Remember that. Remember now. The, remember at that point in time, the, the waters of east and west had dried up. The waters that support Mystery Babylon had dried up, and now. Um, the, if you will look at the Millerites as John the Baptist, as they, as they were preparing the, preparing the way for the coming of the Lord in 1844. But the, but the angel, which is, but remember that it's a progression from the time that the, the latter rain, sorry, the, or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, as, as Ellen White put it, the manifestation of the power of God that, is, that began in 1840 as the angel of Revelation 10 comes down with the little book open in his hand. 
and we see that, that this um, light, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit swells. It becomes more um, and more prominent in those who are proclaiming the message in that time period of 1840, 1844. Um, there, is, there, there is something I want to say at this time, and then there were some questions being posed concerning the, the, the end of the Second War, and I believe this is a, a, the appropriate time to bring it in. Um, the pioneers, to be, to be exact, Haskell um, puts the end of the Second War in 1840. Now, in 1840, if, if you were to accept that, then you would, that would exclude the experiences of the Millerites or the, the, the experience of the Ten Virgins, 1840, 1844. To do that um, would be an error because the experience of the, of the Millerites is included in or, or under, the, on, on, under the Third World. And the biblical principle is that the, that the first... The first scene, combined, sorry, plus the second scene gives you the third scene, or gives you the events that, are tra that transpired. When I say this, I'm not explaining this very well. Um, those of us who, who have ever looked into the three Elijahs will see that the events that transpired under the first Elijah, plus the events that transpired under the second Elijah, John the Baptist, combine together to give you the events under the third Elijah. In like manner, the same for the three abominations. Um, and as Jeff, Jeff is going through in, uh, with us for some time now, it, he's, he's been emphasizing on this point that in the testimony of two witnesses, a thing is established. And we can give you more than two witnesses concerning um, this principle. In like manner, the first woe combined with the second woe should equal, to, equal the third woe. If you exclude the Millerites, from the second world, then that will not be the case. So you would have to end the second world in 1844. The reason for um, the reason for Haskell ending the second world in 1840, because he, if you will go with me to Revelation 11, where the second world ends. And verse 14, he says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Haskell read, read between those words that the, the, uh, 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 an element of, of um, time is introduced, a time lapse between the end of the second woe and the, end, and the beginning of the third woe, because, it, because the wording says, Behold, the third woe cometh quickly. So he's saying that it doesn't come straight away. But that can be said equally for the statement in Revelation chapter 9. If you go with me to Revelation 9, verse 12, where the first war ends, it says, One war is past, and behold, there, there come two wars more hereafter. You can easily read a time lapse in those words, between those two wars, but that's not the case. In 1449, the first war ended, and the second war began straight away. So it's important. He, um, the argument that, he, that Haskell brings, up, brings across concerning the reason for ending the second war in 1840 and introducing the time lapse of the Millerites before the third war begins um, is not really, um, doesn't really hold that much water. Um, again, the, the testimony of two witnesses established that you must end the Second War in 1844. Um, I want you to go with me now to, and we discussing the scenes surrounding 1840, the events that are surrounding 1840, as we see the winds are held in check by the angel that, from, that the ceiling angel from the east, and as we see this beast rising from the bottom, from, sorry, rising from the earth with the woman carrying the woman, and we see the angel descending with the little book in his hand. Now those events are very important to identify, to, 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 to fix in your mind, because, because those, those events are repeated again in relationship to the latter rain 
or, the, or, or when the angel of Revelation 18 begins his descent. So it's important to bear these points in mind. Um, I want you to go with me to Revelation chapter 11, if you, you may be there already. Revelation 11 and verse 15 and, um, and read, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. I want you to drop down with me to verse 18. Remember that when, when, the, when, the angel, when this angel sound, when this seventh angel sound, and the seventh angel is the third war, which, is, which we were discussing, um, verse 19, first of all, tells you when this angel descend, or when, when this war began, began. Verse 19 says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the ark, of his testament. And we know the Ark of the Testament or the Ark of the Covenant is found in the most holy place. So when that was opened in 1844, um, when that was seen in 1844, when the angels sounded, the first event that transpired was that Ark of the Testament was seen, thus beginning the third world. But there are events, other events are transpiring on the, the sounding of this angel. I want you to, I want you to, um, Drop down with me to verse 18. These are, these are some of the events that are transpiring under this angel as he sounds. Verse 18 says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto the, thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that feared thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. There's a lot, of, a lot of events have been described here that is taking place under the sounding of this angel. Um, I will not focus on all of them. Um, if you notice, I have, I have skipped the aspect of the, the sealing that is taking place um, because we've covered that before. Um, the sealing, rather, or the unfolding of the little book, which really is the sealing of the people of God, uh, as the angel descended in 1840, and there's a sealing process taking place in the five wise and the five foolish. The five foolish were sealed by the powers of darkness, the five wise by the powers from above. And we came to a time period when um, the five foolish were cleansed out of God's church. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. We, come, we, we just came to, this, to the sounding of the third angel as we read in Revelation chapter 11, um, verse 15, 18, and 19. Um, I want you to pay attention to verse 18, the, 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 the first part of it, which states, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged. Um, Ellen White in... Early writings, page 36, she says, I saw that the anger of the nations, the wrath of God, and the time to judge the dead were separate and distinct, one following the other. Um, so it is, clear, it is clear that that we have to look at these events as separate events, the Spirit of Prophecy is saying so. Um, so the, the nations were angry. Um, thy wrath has come at the time of the dead that they should be judged. The wrath here points to the, the outpouring of the plague is God's judgment upon Babylon. And the time of the dead points to the time after the millennium is over when the wicked dead are judged. So as you can see that the, the third world goes all the way down to the end of the millennium. I want to focus on the anger of the nations. If you will bear in mind, yesterday as we, as we went through the slide, um, showing you the parallel of the battle of, of Persia and Rome, um, which took place, first of all, in Eastern Rome, 
And then that battle, remember that Rome, Rome traveled this um, perilous journey all the way to the back doors of, of Persia, then launched her attack, the Battle of Nineveh. We see that's the case in 1798 when Persia and Rome fought the battle where Rome lost and Rome, Rome now being carried by the lamb-like beast travels this journey and um, achieve a moral, a moral defeat um, over the lamb-like beast. And then from there, she launched her armies and we saw the Battle of Nineveh taking place in 1989 as Daniel 11 verse 40 bring to view the, the, the union of the United States of America and, and Rome to remove communism. But we know that, that, that this, remember that this was a freeway war to, de to determine who would be the head of the new world order. And it's obvious that the papacy must win according to Bible prophecy because Revelation 13 verse 12 if you go there with me, Revelation 13, verse 12, we are already told that, and he, the lamb-like beast, exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused of the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. We know that the um, United States of America is to be supportive of the papacy in her agenda. We know also the United States of America began the role of Clovis, as remember Ellen White in manuscript releases when she, um, when she, put, when she took us to the, to the rise of the papacy um, before, she, um, before she gained control of Europe, she had three obstacles to overcome. And Ellen White says that the history surrounding the rise of the papacy will be repeated in the, the, the second time after she is grieved. And we know she was grieved in 1798 and she need arms to stand on her, on her part to remove the free obstacles, which we've been covering extensively uh, with Jeff. So 1989 began the process where the United States of America became the arms that stood on the papacy's path to remove the, uh, her obstacles in the way. So, but it also, it also repeats the history of the Battle of Nineveh because Persia and Rome were contending for the territory. The territory was the whole world or the whole earth. And Persia lost by reason that she had now become supportive to the papal agenda rather than being the leader. The leader. Remember, following the Battle of Nineveh on the east, Revelation 9, or rather the fifth trumpet began, the winds began to blow. Sorry, the, the torment, she began to be tormented. Eastern Rome began to be tormented, or the armies of Rome, be, Islam began to torment the armies of Rome, or attack the armies of Rome. So we see in 1989 that the United States of America became the armies of Rome, and we see that Islam's, Islam began her attack in 2001. 2001, we saw also what transpired in 1840, when the nations came together to decide the fate of Islam, we see that this is, the, this, is the, this is part of the main talks that is taking place with the United Nations and the United States of America and the, and, and the papacy. The papacy is involved in, in all of that to decide the fate of radical Islam. So we, come, we have come to this point in time um, where Revelation 9, Revelation 9 is being repeated again under the third world, the events that transpired under Revelation 9. Um, if you will see that 1989, what happened in 1798, the beast that was carrying the woman, we can see that in 1989, the United States of America allowed the papacy to climb back up on, on her back, um, this time literally, to begin, the, to, to begin the process of dismantling her enemies. And of, of course, the whole purpose of that is in connection with the coming of Christ. Um, but Antichrist is, is, is attempting to come before Christ in order to deceive the whole world. As this beast is rising, what should follow is the angel of Revelation 18 in response as the angel of Revelation 10 
descended to meet the rising beast. Um, concerning that this time, concerning this time period, remember that at that point in time, Anna White, remember the statement we read, she said about the anger of the nations, the, the uh, wrath of God and the time of the dead are, are successive events, one following the other. And um, really and truly, as she, she's identifying, when she's, well, really, the, the revelator is identifying the anger of the nations that are taking place as a result of the winds that are blowing. And you can see that, you can see that radical Islam is causing the nations at this point in time to be angry. But there's a statement that, that Ellen White states, um, there's a statement in early writings in regards to the time period when the nations will be angry. Um, I'll begin with the red highlighted area. She says that the commencement of the time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plagues shall begin to be poured out, but to a short period just before they are poured out while Christ is in the sanctuary. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth, and the nations will be angry, she, she quotes that, yet held in check. If you will visualize, remember that the winds that were blowing back there just before we, we got into the time period of 1840, 1844, um, had to be held in check. So that, so that the sealing process can take place. If you will follow the statement that Ellen White is making here, she says here, um, the nations will be angry, yet held in check, so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. Now what is the work of the third angel? We are told in earlier writings, page 118, that he is a sealing angel. He's the angel that is to seal and bind the wheat for the heavenly garner. So she says, at that time, the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues shall be poured out. So, in, as, you, um, as you bring these, these thoughts from the spirit of prophecy and from, the, from, from, from um, John the Revelator to your mind, you, you, you begin to see the picture that is developing right here is this very same picture that developed um, in a time period of 1840, 1844. And it brings to mind the statement Ellen White makes. She, she says the 10 versions will be repeated to the very letter. And the very events that led to um, the power coming into the experience of the, of, of the wise virgins are transpiring right now as we stand here. So, um, in fact, Jesus, as he dealt with this subject, and I want you to go with me to Luke 21. Well, first of all, to Matthew 24. Um, Beginning from verse 1, it says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him and, and to show, for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privily, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And I want to drop down to, to verse 15. He says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Um, and we know that the Apostle Paul described what that abomination was, the man of sin sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Earlier writings, page 55, Ellen White described um, Satan sitting upon the throne, or the throne of Catholicism in the minds of the foolish virgins that had carried her to that place. 
Um, this was the man of sin sitting in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. The abomination spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Satan had taken up his seat in the holy place on the throne of Catholicism, which was the doctrines of Rome in the minds of men, while Christ, or God the Father, had taken up his seat in the minds of the wise virgins through the message of Christ in their heart. It's not difficult to understand what these principles are, are teaching us concerning how the heavenly beings or the plan of salvation is being fulfilled in us. However, um, Jesus pointed to the abomination of desolation. Then he said, if you will drop to, jump with me to verse 29, he says, Immediately after, after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not, not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Um, and then he says in verse 30, he says, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in the heaven. And then shall, sorry, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the nation, the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Um, the Millerites, the Millerites saw as Jesus took them to 1833 when the, the falling of the stars took place and he, not, he took them to his coming in the clouds in 1844 um, to the ancient of days to begin the judgment. Um, Jesus, I want you to go with me to Luke 21. And Jesus did much more than identifying his coming in the clouds. In Luke 21, in answering this very same question, Jesus was answering the very same question in Luke 21 concerning um, the very same question um, in relationship to his coming. And then he took them through the very same steps we saw in Matthew 24. Um, all the way to the most holy place where he came to the ancient of days. And then he spake a parable in the light of this, or to give them better understanding of what he had just said. In verse, from verse 29 of the chapter, he said, um, and he spake to them a parable, behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Now, Ellen White, in dealing with this subject, she says, she quotes, well, she quotes what Jesus says, Christ had bidden his, his, his people watch for the signs of his advent and, re and rejoice as they should behold the tokens of their coming king. When these things begin to come to pass, he said, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. He pointed his followers to the budding trees of spring and said, when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, know ye, that the kingdom of God is at hand. So she, remembering that she says, he pointed his followers to the budding trees of spring. Now why spring? Why, is, why does Ellen White use the word spring to describe this moment? Well, in the art point of the Holy Spirit is normally referred, is, is, Normally described as, as, as rain, rain being poured out upon the people of God. And you will find many texts in the Bible to support that. Spring, it is during springtime that uh, the rainy season comes to bring the grain to their ripened stage. 
And Jesus was pointing his followers to the budding trees of spring. He was pointing them to the time when the Spirit of God will be outpoured upon the people of God that they will be able to stand in the disappointment that was, that was up ahead. So first of all, he pointed them to the budding trees in 1840. In 1840, the angel, that's with the budding trees, um, the trees began to bud when the angel of Revelation 10 descended with the little book open in his hand. This, as Ellen White described it, that time period, she says, it was a manifestation of the power of God. And she compares it to Pentecost and she compares it to the angel of Revelation 18. So the whole point of, this, of the spirit there um, began a budding process, a budding process that reaches maturity in 1843-44. Um, so concerning that, concerning that generation, if you go back with me to Luke, the book of Luke, he says in verse 31, he says, So likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, <clears throat> this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall, shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And it's in, it can clearly be seen that Jesus was 100% accurate as he predicted that the generation that would see the increase of knowledge, the generation that would see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit would not pass before he comes to the most holy place in the clouds, uh, in the clouds to the ancient of days. In like manner, as we see the, the history surrounding 1840 being repeated, the third world repeating the first and second world, the winds are blowing, the nations are angry, um, and as this power from beneath is rising, the beast is carrying the woman, the angel descends at that point in time with the same little book in his hand open. As we describe the events that are transpiring under the first and second angel's messages are the very same events that are transpiring under the third angel's messages. And those events are the movements of verse 41 to, to, verse, to Michael standing up. As these very events transpired in the Millerites time period, 1840 to Michael standing up. The, the little book is the increase of knowledge that a people must have in order to stand in the disappointment that is to come. So Jesus is saying concerning that generation, he, say, he says, this generation shall not pass. Amen. We are the generation, my brothers and sisters, that sees the end of the world. And we must now begin to live our lives as did the Millerites when they recognized that Jesus was coming. Amen. He was coming in 1844. We know that he's coming for this generation. He's coming for every man, woman, and child in this room. And we don't have a lot of time. As Jeff points out all the time, the Sunday law is the finish line for Adventism. But we can't wait for the Sunday law. We have to get ready now because the Sunday law is the crisis that will reveal, is the disappointment that will reveal whether we had received the latter rain or not, um, whether we had received that increase of knowledge, whether that increase of knowledge had led us to repent, had led us to make right, you know, the wrongs that we had done, and whatever, whatever that stands between us and Christ is now time to remove that. As you saw that the, the actions of the Millerites, they had made right wrongs, they had, basically they had removed themselves from this world. And Daniel 12, 12 describes them as, a, as um, being, reaching, being in a state where they were ready to meet their Lord. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 13, 35, that blessed hour the five wise virgins were ready. We're now in the budding process, and we either budding towards hell or we budding towards heaven, dependent on whether this increase of knowledge is impacting us as it should. As Ellen White says, if the truth for this time, if the light that us if the truth that for this time, if the events that are thickening on every hand are not sufficient to arouse our sleeping energies, then darkness proportionate to the light will overtake the sleeping virgins. 
it's now time, brethren, to recognize that we're the, we're the generation that sees the end of it, or everything tells us that, and Jesus has given us enough to know when it is near. And the Spirit of Prophecy says in the Great Controversy, page 371, no man knoweth the day nor the hour, but she says we are, it is, we are instructed to know when it is near. She says it is fatal for us not to know when it is near as it was to the antediluvian world. It is important to recognize this time, as in, I mean, closing in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. And this is we can say with certainty that this verse was written for this time. It says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Amen. Shall we? You for the closing prayer. Dear Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us to see these things, that you've opened these things unto us, Lord, and that you've hid these things from the wise and the prudent. We thank you, Lord, that you have Oh, Lord, allow us to be here in this prophecy school whereby, Lord, we can go over these things and bring our lives into conformity, Lord, as we recognize the day drawing near. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will move upon the hearts of all of us, that, Lord, we will remove from our minds and our lives everything that defiles his temple. And that, Lord, as a publican, O oh Lord, had repented, recognizing his wretchedness, and even as you have said to us, our condition, our Laodicean condition, we pray, O oh Lord, that you will lead us to repent and that everything that defiles, everything that offends the kingdom of heaven will be taken away, Lord. As we recognize this solemn time, this time that where we should be sober and not be drunken with the cares of this life, help us, I pray, Lord, to, O oh Lord, make use of every moment that we have, even with this school, Lord, which is only but a few more days to go. Help us to grasp and, oh Lord, bring these things into our experience that we are learning here at this time. That, Lord, we may be an example and a light to those who are in darkness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.